record this session. Um, there's already videos out there, but I'm going to record it just so I can look back at it and see what kind of quality we get and if this is, you know, a viable al alternative to me making YouTube videos and posting them. Um, all right, so let's go to share screen and all right, so you should be looking at my screen now. Uh, you should be looking at the course outline. Um, and if not, try and signal me somehow. Um, so yeah, this is uh, Comp 1805 Discrete Structures 1 in the summer of 2020. This is going to be a unique experience probably for a lot of you, although uh, some of you may have, have completed this past year at uh, Carleton, and so you're slightly familiar with uh, Good. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so maybe you're slightly familiar with the protocol. Maybe you've had classes that have, have switched to online at the last minute. Uh, I guess some of you might be coming from high school and this might be your first uh, experience with university. Um, that's, that's a little bit of a shame, but we're going to, we're going to make it work. Uh, it, it's going to be great. It's going to be, uh, fine, you'll be communicating more through message boards and uh, and videos and things like that, but uh, um, we certainly want to to try and keep as much of that uh, you know that camaraderie uh, that you would that you would experience. Uh, we want to keep as much of that intact as possible you know whenever we can. Um, so we're really uh, we really want to encourage people to you know, uh, get to know each other and get to know the teaching staff and things like that. Um, so the lectures are Monday, 5.30 to 8.30. You should, uh, you should be aware of that. Um, my office hours are tentatively Tuesday, 4 to 6, or that's probably going to be pretty loose. Um, I'm open to appointments uh, if you want to discuss anything. But, uh, of course, the TAs are going to have office hours as well, so you should, uh, should definitely visit them uh, on Discord. Um, <laughs> We have one recommended textbook, although it's not required. Um, so you can download this off of CU Learn, and uh, it's just another resource, although there are plenty of, of resources without the textbook, um, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, the breakdown, the assessment is uh, as follows here. So um, we're going to have a weekly mandatory, mandatory tutorial activities. Um, four assignments and four quizzes that will be given as online activities. So this is a, a little bit different traditionally because we, the quizzes you're going to be, are going to be open book essentially. We can't monitor you, so to make it fair to everyone, uh, we have to make them open book. Um, so they might be a little bit tougher because you have access to those resources, but uh, you know, uh, it's not too tough uh, if you've, uh, the people that experienced H105 last semester have already experienced this, and uh, and they managed to pass, so it, it, it's it should be fine. The averages were were about the same as they normally are. Um, yeah, so the tutorials there's six of them. They're worth two percent each. The assignments there's four of them. They're worth three point five percent each. Uh, the quizzes there's uh, four of them. They're worth six percent each, and then the final exam is fifty percent. Um, so I don't know, man. I'm shooting in the dark here in terms of what, uh, I mean, this is traditionally the route that we go. It's a little bit different now because uh, quizzes and exams are open book. However, um, the reason that these things are weighted so lightly, um, in particular, you have a lot of tutorials that are worth, you know, 2% each. So you can, and assignments are only worth 3.5. Those assignments are learning experiences um, and you should, the problem is with a lot of first year students is that they miss deadlines. Oh, I, I didn't get my assignment in in time. And it's like, well, you get zero, but it's only worth 3.5. So the fact that, that these are small percentages uh, gives you sort of room to make mistakes if you're a first year student and you're just getting yet ready, to, uh, just getting used to the university system. So that's sort of the idea behind these things. Um, although they are all learning, they're all assessments. And so you can, you don't want to give away those marks because they're in a sense, you know, I don't want to say easy marks, but they're very achievable marks. And, uh, but if you do mess up, then it's not the end of the world. And then the final exam is 50%. So we're going to be, 
it's open book, it's online, uh, and we're going to be, so the quizzes and the final, we're going to be clamping down a little bit and trying to find anybody who's, who's using cheating websites. Um, I don't like doing that. I don't want to be, um, you know, an inquisitor or anything like that. I'd rather just teach, but you kind of have to, you kind of, we have to keep people uh, honest. We don't want to make, because if, if cheating was very, very easy, then honest people are even going to do it. So we, we have to, in a sense, you know, use the carrot and the stick. So, so we're going to be monitoring any possible cheating websites, perhaps using honey pots and things like that um, for the quizzes and the final exams. And the, uh, the consequences, consequences for getting caught cheating are, are quite serious. Um, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so tutorials and quizzes are going to be online activities. You'll find them in CU Learn. It's just a link. Uh, there'll be a range of time where you can do it. The tutorials will probably be a week. Uh, the quizzes will be less, uh, but you click on it and then you have uh, the tutorials. I, I think it's open the amount of time you need and you're allowed to collaborate on them. The quizzes will be uh, one hour. And so once you click on it, you have one hour to complete it. And uh, and the assignments are, are the same as before. So you download them and then you uh, create a, a document, a typeset document, a PDF, and then you upload it to see you learn by the uh, deadline. Um, and the tutorials, uh, there'll be a short lesson. So we have a TA that's making videos for you. Uh, there'll be very short videos and then you can discuss, you can go to office hours, you can go on Discord and discuss uh, the things that you've seen and possibly what, what you need to do and, uh, and yeah, the tutorials are your chance really to, to collaborate a lot with your with your classmates. Uh, collaboration is allowed and encouraged. Um, of course, you all have to do your own work uh, when it comes time to click the little buttons. But um, yeah, uh, and there's there's a certain um, and there is uh, a bank of questions. So the the questions will be sort of random along the same topics. Um, so you know, hopefully that will discourage. Uh, any type of collaboration that people want to try and do. Um, assignments are mandatory and you see, see you learn to submit them. So your first uh, tutorial sort of goes over how we expect these assignments to be completed. So the first tutorial is a great learning experience for how we, how you should do your assignments. Um, and quizzes will be see you learn activities given in place of your weekly tutorial. So you get either a quiz or a tutorial uh, almost every week. Although we have a lot of room to play uh, since it's a full summer course, um, we have uh, some extra time, so we have to figure out what we want to do with it. Um, yeah, an open book means uh, any websites or material uh, not approved is still strictly forbidden. So open book means class materials only, slides, notes, textbooks, and approved websites. So the, uh, um, what is it? It's the, the CG Lab Discrete Math Study Center. That's fine. <laughs> um, but outside uh, outside websites are not. Uh, what is different about this semester? Uh, we're delivering it using an alternate structure. Um, so it's not our uh, it's not our intention to make this easy. It's our intention to make it you you for you to learn the material and be thoroughly assessed on it. Um, but our core um, philosophy is really reliability here and accessibility because um, if you can't access the material um, yeah if you can't access the material uh, then you can't possibly do the course so um, and then flexibility because uh, this is new to us it's probably new to you as well um, so we're going to try stuff out like this zoom and see what works and what doesn't. And, uh, we're going to keep the stuff that works and, uh, the stuff that doesn't, we're going to move to something else. Um, but, uh, yeah, so lectures will be posted to with links on CEO learn and discord. Uh, the only thing, uh, that's still up in the air is whether I do, uh, lectures beforehand. So if I do that, they'll be well edited. Um, you know, I can edit out mistakes and uh, adapt my slides on the fly and things like that. Um, and they'll probably be a little bit shorter. Uh, otherwise, I record these sessions and then post them. So one of those two things will be happening uh, depending on 
what you guys like and what you guys want uh, and what works for uh, most of you. Uh, tutorials will be a short video uh, followed by a quiz activity on CU Learn that must be completed by the following week. So I think uh, it's not 100% sure, but uh, I'm pretty sure seven days for the tutorials, that should be that should be good. Uh, the quizzes, we'll probably have to tighten that a little bit, but uh, the tutorials, it's uh, you'll have time to do them, although don't fall behind, uh, especially if this is uh, your first year in, in, uh, in university. Um, do keep up with the material every week. If you fall behind, you will have a lot of trouble catching up. Um, yeah, quizzes will be done over the course of a number of days or hours. Uh, that's still left to be determined. Office hours uh, and general questions pertaining to tutorials, lectures, quizzes, uh, will be conducted and answered on Discord. So uh, it's it's a nice messaging site. Uh, you know, it's, it's low bandwidth, but you can have breakout rooms where we have videos. Um, so it's very nice that way. It's very flexible, and I think uh, I've seen some of the Discords from last semester, and they're they're nice little communities. So uh, I think that'll work out well. Um, the final exam is two hours, and it'll be an activity on CU Learn. The precise timing and delivery must be coordinated with exam services. So that's, so we don't have too much information on that right now. You'll get information uh, later in the course. Um, and yeah, and then we will experiment with lots of other stuff. So we're gonna see what, see what works and what doesn't. Uh, but I want everybody to be, feel confident that uh, in that our lectures and tutorials and all of these things will be presented to you in the way that I'm giving you here. Uh, everything else is just bonus. So if you want to show up to these lectures and participate and ask questions and uh, and have sort of a, a little more of an interactive experience, then that's up to you. Um, but we're guaranteeing you, you know, to get you the material uh, the most reliable way that we can. So we don't want anybody here, you know, watching me uh, and all of a sudden I start, you know, jerking on the, on the screen and the uh, not... <laughs> You know what I mean. Anyway, um, <clears throat> what else? Oh yes, collaboration. So uh, we want you to be uh, hopefully a, a little bit of a community on Discord. Um, we want to encourage collaboration uh, as long as it's the right kind, right? You can't share your solutions, um, but you can direct somebody even, you know, um, into what, yeah, you can direct somebody uh, into the, the proper course. Like you can say like, oh, try DeMorgan's here. That works for me, whatever, that's, that's fine. At the end of the day, I'm not, uh, I don't want to be uh, really, really rigid. I want anybody who wants to learn, um, I, I want to support that. So. Um, I don't want to be super rigid. However, you know, I said, if your intention is to learn that I want to support you, but I, you know, I don't know what your intentions are. So I have to draw a line somewhere. Uh, we are going to do that. But, uh, you know, if, if in Discord you, you cross the line and stuff like that, uh, you'll get a warning. All right. Nobody's going to uh, come down with uh, academic integrity violation on that. You, you'll be... Uh, warned well in advance of anything like that and generally speaking we're going to be looking on uh, assignments and quizzes and uh, in the final um and for foolproof instances so we're not we're not looking to we're not looking to nail anybody but we have to you know we have to draw the line somewhere <clears throat> all right so now the the course material of course, material, if you view every lecture and complete every assignment, you'll be able to construct arguments and formal proofs using different techniques, solve expressions using uh, arithmetic, propositional and predicate logic and set theory, um, asymptotic analysis of algorithms, that's very important. Um, yeah. Could somebody, um, sorry, somebody's making noise if they could just mute their mic. That would be... Uh, just so we keep uh, if, if you do have a question you want to raise some concern uh, use the hand raise feature and then uh, you can take the floor and, and ask your question but I mean in the meantime we all have to uh, sort of 
exercise this mic discipline. Let's see. All right. So I've remuted all of you. Um, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself. Uh, raise your hand and then unmute yourself. Um, and yeah, so this is, uh, you need a grade of C minus in 1805 before you're allowed to take comp 2804. Um, I don't know what they're doing this summer with the, the SAT, the satisfactory and unsatisfactory. I don't think they're continuing it. Um, even if they do continue it though, uh, although it doesn't appear on your, on your transcripts, we have a record of your grade. So you will not be allowed to uh, take 2804 if you do not have, uh, they are not continuing it. Okay. So they're not continuing it. So you will not be able to take uh, 2804 unless you have a, a, at least a C minus in comp 1805. Late assignments are never accepted for any reason. Um, get on it right away. Start uploading it right away. Uh, there's plenty of time. There's about three weeks for each assignment. Um, so do not leave it to the last minute. And then um, some of you will. And uh, that's the reason why they're, they're, the weight is so low. But yeah, we're not going to accept late assignments. There's too many of you. Uh, it creates too much of, uh, it's not fair to the TAs who have to do the marking that they have to accept all these late assignments. So uh, we don't accept late assignments. Uh, technical problems do not exempt you from this requirement. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that should be pretty clear. Um, for each assignment, you'll be submitting exactly one PDF using uh, Microsoft Office, uh, Google Doc, or LaTeX. So uh, it has to be some sort of typeset document. I don't want to see um, handwritten and, uh, and photographed. That's not acceptable. Um, so you need to learn uh, how to use Microsoft Office, Google Docs, or LaTeX. Um, and it's not that hard in your first. Um, your first tutorial will walk you through some of the techniques that you need. Okay, and make sure that you've submitted it correctly. Um, I usually get a few people in my office uh, after the submission saying, uh, well, I did submit it, but it's not there now. And it's, well, I don't know, I can't, I can't help you. I don't have any proof that you submitted anything. So uh, please make sure that uh, you've done it correctly. Um, you're always expected to show all your work and we are very specific about what kind of work we want to see. So please, please follow that. Um, if you don't show all your work, you're going to lose marks. And sometimes it's overkill, but that it's necessary. Um, at this level, uh, as you get older, then you can sort of, you know, skip steps and, and things like that. Not older, but as you, as you go, as you move on in, into uh, higher level classes, but uh, for now, you have to follow all the steps. Um, this makes it much easier to mark. Um, so some of the TAs, you know, they're, the TAs are young too and inexperienced. So um, we like to, to lay everything out as black and white as we possibly can. So please follow the instructions, show all your work and exactly how we show you to show all your work. Um, and then there's the standard stuff. Um, so at least nine hours per week on this course. Um, the plagiarism policy, so we'll get to that. Um, you should definitely read up on all this uh, request for ac ac academic accommodation, pregnancy obligation, all this stuff. Um, I'm not going to go over it right now, though. Um, right now, I'm going to. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at uh, actually. Yeah, so <clears throat> plagiarism policy. So I have to update this because just one part though. So um, everything must be completed individually. So collaborating on any component other than the tutorials is not permitted. So you can collaborate at the level of discussion. That's no problem, um, but you have to write your own work. You have to do your own work. Um, uh, and it must be your own work that you've developed specifically for this offering. Uh, posting assignment solutions is strictly prohibited. Like I said, uh, we try to, you know, don't show anybody the answer, but you can help them to get to the answer. So that's fine. Um, what else? Yes, showing your rough work on an assignment to anyone but the instructor or teaching assistant. 
copying or modifying solutions from anyone on the internet using internet services or collaborating with tutors, uh, sharing anything from an assignment, quiz, or final exam. Um, those are all examples of academic misconduct. So just to be extra clear about that. Um, and, and the new penalties. Um, so for a first offense, first year students with less than four credits completed, um, no credit for the assignment or activity in question, and a final grade reduction of one full letter grade. Um, and so that's the first, first offense for everyone else is F in the course, second offense is a one year suspension and third offense is expulsion. So it's, um, it's quite serious. Um, so please do all your own work. Um, it's not worth the risk and uh, we will be looking for it. <clears throat> Okay. Um, uh, so before I continue, is there any questions? Use the hand raise feature and I'll try to, uh, like I said, I, I'm new to this. So if, it, if somebody's raising their hand and I don't see it, I apologize, but uh, everything seems to be fine. Okay. Uh, let's go into the calendar. So we have two possible versions actually we have multiple versions so um, this is a full summer course which means uh, they've allotted us 14 three-hour classes and generally a class is or any class during the semester is 12 or 12 and a half uh, three-hour classes increases that okay um, so that uh, gives us a little bit of room to play with. So we have here the one tentative calendar. So we have, uh, so Victoria Day, anytime there's a holiday on a Monday, um, we'll just sort of not have any work that week, except for possibly the last week. Um, but then we have, uh, so we have this version where we, we go all the way through the summer. And then at the end of the summer, we sort of have some two very light weeks. Um, Uh, yeah, the multiple format of the multiple, the format of the exams is, uh, so there are some, a lot of multiple choice, but there's, um, there's alternatives to that. There's short answer and things like that. So um, we'll cover that when we get closer to it. You have to be very careful with short answer questions because it's, it's very picky about formatting, but then we will have TAs that you can appeal if you make a formatting error and stuff like that. Uh, so somebody, uh, somebody just asked me a question in the chat. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to put up a poll probably on uh, CU Learn. So this is one version of the uh, um, calendar where we have a where we have a Slack couple of weeks at the end. Uh, alternatively, we can take a, a week off, sort of in the middle of the semester uh, when the uh, half semester classes or half summer classes are taking uh, are having their exams and we can um, take Canada Day week off. So that's another option. Uh, then everything just gets pushed back a week and uh, there's still lots of room to, to finish. Um, so yeah, I'll post both of those and then uh, I'll put up maybe a poll and you guys can, can decide. Uh, there's no rush on that though. Um, and yeah, you'll see here, uh, week one, there's no tutorial. Uh, starting next week, there'll be the introductory tutorial. You'll have uh, one week to do that. And then it's actually, the following week uh, we have off and then um, the third official week uh, you have your first official tutorial and then the assignment is due. Um, yeah, so after the after Victoria Day things start to get a little bit busy, um, but it's, I mean, that's just the way the summer works out is that there are a few uh, extra holidays thrown in there. Um, okay, and let me see what else I had. Oh yeah, and there is on CU Learn um, an academic integrity uh, short quiz that you have to complete to access your assignments. Um, so once you do that, then you'll have access to basically everything on CU Learn. Um, and okay, so six o'clock. So um, if there are no questions, if there are any questions, uh, please give me them now, or we can start on the. Um, 
we can start on the actual first half of the lecture. So just an introduction to discrete math. But, um, okay. So yes, uh, Gadir. Um, can... So I have a question regarding the tutorial percentage. So I'm not sure like how are the tutorials graded? Is there like attendance or work to be done? Um, right. Yeah, it is. There is work to be done. So it's it's sort of a mini quiz, but it's a it's a relatively easy quiz, and you're allowed to collaborate with your fellow students. Um, so the idea is not to test you at that point, but the idea is to make sure that you're keeping up on the material. Um, so yeah, there will be a little like a mini quiz, um, maybe two or three multiple choice questions, um, or possibly a fill in a table. Um, it'll be short. It'll be something that you should be able to do in 15, 20 minutes after you've learned all the materials. So, um, and yeah, and it's not meant really if you, if you watch the video, if you talk to your TAs, um, and, uh, and then just do the, uh, do the, do the, um, tutorial, it, it should be easy marks. Um, so we're not looking to trip anybody up. Um, any other questions? Um, no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else? Uh, yes, Colin. Um, for the for the tutorial, uh, when can we do them? Do we have to do them only at the time our, our tutorials are, or can we do them any time of the week? Yeah, so it, it will be any, the tutorials will be any time of the week. Uh, we're going to give you a maximum flexibility. So when one tutorial closes, the other one will open up. Um, so you'll have seven days to do them. Um, so yeah, you can do them at your le leisure. And yeah. like I said, I don't recommend falling behind because, well, I don't know. Somebody will, but uh, yeah, uh, you'll have a week to do them. Uh, does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Um, all right, we'll start on the, uh, so this is the first uh, online lecture, uh, live streaming lecture I've ever delivered. And maybe this is the first time you've, uh, You've seen one, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the introduction to discrete math. What is discrete math? Why do we care about it? And uh, and how do we use it? And then after that, we'll take a break um, before we start the next part. All right. So these are based on slide, slides by uh, Dr. Robert Collier, and uh, so basically, I've modified them somewhat. So if you find any mistakes, those are almost certainly mine, and uh, you know, anything that you think is well done is probably done by him. Um, so what is discrete math? Uh, why does it matter to computer science? And how do we apply discrete math to computer science? So these are the questions that we're going to examine in the first half of the lecture. Um, so what is discrete math? Uh, so math, it's math for discrete data. So that's sort of a circular answer, I guess. Uh, but what is discrete data then? Well, it's data that must have a definite value. So this is of particular interest to us as computer scientists because computers also have definite, uh, always, all their data is always has a definite value. Um, so for an example, let's imagine some coordinates. We draw them on a, a piece of paper or whatever from zero to zero to four. And each point, each point has a definite location so here or here or here. Um, but when we go to describe the location, uh, now we start to run into a little bit of difficulty, right? Because this doesn't quite line up with the one um, on either side. So now when we try and describe that location, uh, we have to give sort of imprecise uh, arguments. So maybe it's something like this. Um, but at some point, we have to cut off the... Um, yeah, uh, somebody raised their hand. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just, uh, are you sharing your screen or 
like are we looking at it ourselves because i can't see anything you can't see but anything no your screen is still on the calendar and your <laughs> okay uh, yeah all right you can see your face so ah uh, thank you all right let's let's start over then uh can you see that now we can see you but the screen that you're sharing is is still the calendar oh yeah i have to share okay thank you very much yeah i do have to stop that share and start a new one all right thank you sorry for that yes and thank you <laughs> okay um let's share this All right. Okay, can everybody see now? All right, perfect. Okay, and I'm going to get rid of my video just to uh, whatever. It's not necessary. It'll likely just be in the way. Um, okay, so introduction to discrete mathematics. Sorry about that. Let's let's start over. Um, so these are slides by Dr. Robert Collier. So um, I've modified them. And so any mistakes that you see are mine and uh, anything you see that is correct and, uh, you know, insightful is likely his. Um, okay. So what is discrete math? Why does it matter to computer science? And how do we apply discrete math to computer science? Okay. So uh, those are the three questions that we're going to look at uh, up to the break. And we're going to try and answer them, at least, you know, give you an introduction to an answer. So uh, discrete math is math for discrete data, but that's sort of a roundabout answer. So what is discrete data? It's data that must have a definite value. And so as an example of data that must have a definite value, as opposed to indefinite, we can imagine a set of coordinates uh, drawn perhaps on a piece of paper. Um, so each point has a definite location, for instance, uh, we, we can see exactly where this point is. But when we want to describe the location, um, that becomes a little more difficult because now we have to sort of guess a little bit um, because it could have real coordinates. And by real, it means that um, it could have a lot of digits. Um, and it could even have, you know, depending on the type of numbers that we're working with, if they're irrational, they could have infinite di digits. But uh, generally, you won't find a... Um, yeah, we won't be working with that here, but um, so we can't describe these locations precisely. However, if we put a grid down and then we moved each of these points to some exact coordinate. Now, uh, what we've done, we've lost some precision, but uh, we have a definite each point now has a definite location and that we can work with and do some very precise things with it. So some precision is lost when we do this. So we can only ever approximate some of these numbers. We can never, we can never get them exactly. Um, but what we can do is make a discrete model of our problem. So um, a lot of problems in the real world that we want to model in computer science, we have to give up, you know, certain precisions and, and work with this discrete data. Um, because computers are discrete machines that operate on discrete data. So uh, they're made up of bits. And so everything in a computer can be either every single individual bit of memory can either be on or off. And alternatively, we can describe it as zero or one or true or false on or off. These are all um, equivalent in uh, when we're talking about computers and the, and the memory and the data that they use. Um, so whenever we have data in a computer, it's always well-defined. So we always know the precise state of that data. Um, even if it's uh, whatever we're modeling, we lose some precision. In the computer, it's always very definite. There's no such thing as mm, between somewhere between 0 and 1. Um, each bit should be either on or off. Um, so discrete math then helps us to better understand discrete data and how we're going to basically how we're going to solve problems on a computer. So using a computer, what problems can we solve? Well, we can answer that problem. We can answer that question using discrete math. 
how do we solve them? What steps do we take? Um, and what resources, time, and memory are required to solve them. So we want to answer all of these questions as they relate to computers and the discrete data that they work on. And so that's what sort of the purpose behind you learning discrete math at this point is. Um, so we want to do a couple of things. We want to specify the problem in a very precise way. So in, by precise, we mean basically discrete. So uh, we're going to make a mathematical model of our problem uh, that is a discrete mathematical model. And then we're going to solve it using a computer program. So a computer program is an algorithm and an algorithm is a sequence of very precise instructions. So this is sort of um, the applied version of, of an algorithm, but we have mathematical definitions of these things that we're going to use for discrete math. Um, but it's not usually that, it's usually quite easy or at least, uh, you know, not difficult to, try to translate an algorithm into an actual program. Um, so we're going to use discrete math tools uh, to prove things like uh, the correctness of our solution. Um, we're going to make sure that it terminates. So um, I don't know if you've ever started up a program and then stared at a blue ring that went around and around and around. So that's, we want to generally avoid that whenever possible. So we can, we can use discrete math to prove that, Hey, our solution will terminate. And then we can use it to prove how efficient our solution is. So um, generally uh, we're going to model some, some computer operation and then we're going to count the number of operations. So even, even in efficiency, uh, we want a short amount of time, but that's dependent on hardware and things like that. So when we're talking about discrete math, we're talking about discrete operations. So even in terms of efficiency, we still use discrete math. <clears throat> All right, so now we're going to, uh, that's sort of the very high level view of discrete math. Um, any questions on any of that? Okay, so we're gonna look at some example problems in discrete math and we're gonna look at how we arrive at a solution. So we're gonna start off with some basically logic problems. Now these are just basically, these are riddles. Uh, you may have heard them before, um, but how they apply to us is that they are logic problems and computers are pretty good at solving logic problems um, if you understand how to solve them. So we're going to look at these riddles and then we're going to uh, look at how we would solve them systematically. And then we'll look at, uh, uh, at the end we'll have uh, one last example that's a little more real world. But, uh, so we visit an island with two types of inhabitants, uh, knights who always tell the truth and knaves who always lie. And we are met by two inhabitants and we cannot tell them apart physically. So um, we know that they can be either a knave or a knight, um, but we don't know who is who. Um, so knowing what we know, using this information, uh, what useful information can we get from them? Can we discern anything? Um, such as who is a knight and who is a knave? So to start with, the man in green says, the man in yellow is a knave. And the man in yellow says, we are both knights. So now we have a little bit more information and we want to try and use this and solve this problem uh, systematically. Now, maybe you've heard this riddle before and if not, maybe you could think about it for a little bit and figure it out. Um, but we don't, want to, we don't want to rely on intuition. So intuition is going to work probably for you in this case because it's a simple problem. Um, but our goal here is something more systematic, something more that a computer could do uh, just by following a sequence of instructions. <clears throat> so how can we figure out which is a knight and which is a knave? Uh, first, we need to model the problem. So what does it mean to tell the truth or tell a lie? Um, well, statements can be um, imperative, so you can give a command. They can be interrogative, so you could ask a question. Or they could be declarative or, or an assertion. And in that case, they communicate information. Um, so what sort of information? 
values. Um, so what it is is, um, and we can classify these values as true or false. So each of the, the inhabitants says something and then we can say that, well, the information that they gave us is correct or the information that they gave us is incorrect. Um, so they give us basically one bit of information and then we can decide whether it's true or false. And so using our model, we would say that knights can only make a declarative statement with the value of true and knaves can only make a declarative statement with a value of false. So any information that comes from a knave is going to be incorrect and any information that comes from a knight is going to be correct. All right, so the man in green says the man in yellow is a knave. The man in yellow says we are both knights. And each of these statements has a value of true or false. So how do we solve this question for others like it? And like I mentioned earlier, the important thing is that we do it systematically. So we're not gonna rely on our intuition, even though we could probably solve it. Um, we want to come up with a process that we can solve this. Um, so the process we're gonna use is, is quite, the, quite a simple one. We're gonna look at all the different possibilities. So this is all the different possibilities. Either they're both knights, they're both knaves, uh, the man in green is a knave, the man in yellow is a knight, or the man in green is a knight and the man in yellow is a knave. So we're gonna examine each of these possibilities and then we're going to see uh, which one, basically we're gonna see which ones make sense. And uh, so this is what we mean by systematically. We're just going to enumerate all the possibilities and then say, maybe at the end we'll come up with, well, this is the only one that's possible. Uh, so let's look at each case. Um, so case one, both men are knights. So let's look. So if green is a knight, then green only makes true statements. And green says the man in yellow is a knave. Um, however, we know that yellow is a knight. So that's what we have up here. Thus green has told a lie. But uh, green cannot tell a lie. So green is a knight and green only makes true statements. So we've reached a contradiction. So we have green only makes true statements up here and we have green lied down here. Both of those things can't be true at the same time. And that's what we call, oops, that's what we call a contradiction. All right, we reach two, um, two pieces of information that cannot both be true at the same time. Um, so that means this combination uh, cannot be the correct one. Uh, so let's look at uh, case two, green is a knave and yellow is a knave. So if green is a knave, green only makes false statements and green said the man in yellow is a knave. Um, that happens to be true. So green made a true statement, but green only makes false statements. Again, that's a contradiction. Both of those things cannot be true at the same time. So we've examined two possibilities and we've decided that neither of them uh, can be the correct, uh, the correct outcome. Uh, so let's look at possibility three. Green is a knave and yellow is a knight. All right. So if yellow is a knight, then yellow only makes true statements. And yellow says we are both knights. Uh, however, green is a knave and thus yellow has made a false statement. So yellow only makes true statements, but yellow made a false statement. Again, we have a contradiction. So number three can't be correct. So that leaves number four. So we have green is a knight and yellow is a knave. Um, so if green is a knight, green only makes true statements. And he said the man in yellow is a knave. That's true. So there's no contradiction there. Yellow is a knave. Yellow only makes false statements. And yellow said we are both knights. That is a false statement. So there's no contradiction there either. So since we have no contradictions, it can be true that green is a knight and yellow is a knave. That's possible. Um, however, we have some other information is that every other possibility uh, was a contradiction. So that means this one must be true because we've eliminated all of the possibilities and this one can be true. So 
we've, we've systematically and logically worked through the problem uh, to come to a solution. All right, so here's another variant on that. Um, this is a little bit different. Now we're going to be uh, working with, uh, with our own information that we're going to pass to these, these two clowns. One is a knight and one is a knave. So one always tells the truth and one always lies. And there's two paths uh, and one of them leads to certain doom. So we want to ask a single yes or no question and determine which of the paths is safe. So what question should we ask? So let's, first of all, let's examine the problem. So let's model it a little bit. Um, so of course, yes is true and no is false. Um, so if I ask, for example, should I go down this path or does this path lead to certain doom? Um, if they say uh, yes or actually, no, that's not even. Yeah, so there's a mistake. And that, that's mine, so, so ignore this. Um, but if they say yes, and yes is correct, then that's a true statement. And if they say no, and no is incorrect, or no is correct, then that's also a true statement. Um, but if they say no, and that's false, then uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> if they say no, and it's false, then that's, um, then yeah, then it's false. So we want the truth value associated with our declarative statement, uh, but we're going to phrase it like a question. So we're going to say, is statement X true? Um, but you don't know whether the clown you ask is a knight or a knave. So what is the question to ask? So what we want to ask is basically, is the right-hand path safe to go down or is the left-hand path safe to go down? And we're going to ask one of the clowns, should we go this way? Um, is this safe? And they will answer yes or no. Or we can ask the other clown, is this safe? And they will answer yes or no. Um, and then we're going to determine which way we should go. Um, so we are making a declarative statement with a value and passing it through a clown that may change the value. So this is, when we ask a clown, we're giving them information and then they're passing it back to us and possibly changing the value of it. Um, so we, if, we, if we ask the knight, the value does not change. And if we ask the knave, the value does change. So if we ask the knight, if we say, is this path safe to go down? Then sort of the, the statement is that the path is safe to go down. And if he says yes, or if it is safe to go down, then he will say yes, he won't change the value. Um, and if it's not safe, then he will say no. So the truth value associated with our statement, which is this path is safe to go down. Um, if we run that through the knight, it will come back uh, as uh, he will say yes if it's true and no if it's false. Um, but if we ask the knave, then the knave is going to do the opposite. He's going to change the value of that. Um, so we want to somehow ask both. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to ask, would the other clown tell me that your path leads to safety and not certain do? So if the clown you ask says yes, then his path is the wrong path. And, uh, and that's it. So what we've, what we've done is um, we're sort of passing our information through both the knight and the knave. So what we know is that one always lies and one always tells the truth. So if we pass our information through both, um, we know that the knight's going to tell the truth, but the knave is going to lie. So what we're going to get back is going to be um, a lie, so to speak. Um, so if you ask the knave, we're really asking, would the knight say that your path is safe? And the knave would lie, so we do the opposite. Um, and if we ask the knight, uh, we're really asking, would the knave say that your path is safe? And the knave would lie, so do the opposite. So we've passed our information through both clowns, and we know that one of them, exactly one of them will change it. All right, so these are classical puzzles that can be solved through a systematic, uh, methodical process of elimination. And that's not, I mean, that is, uh, in the most basic computer science, that we do, that's what we do. That's brute force. So we just go through all possibilities until we find the correct one. Um, in these examples, only one of the possible solutions is accurate, um, i.e. does not create a contradiction. And, uh, you know, so if you like X, K, C, D, then here's the, uh, there's always a relevant uh, 
XKCD cartoon, and this is the relevant XKCD cartoon for this. Um, all right. So we, we're going to look at one final problem. Uh, and this is rooted a little more in the real world. Um, we're going to consider an intersection and we're going to decide on an efficient programming for the lights, for the traffic lights. So this is, you should all be familiar with it. You've all uh, driven and come to a stoplight and then had to wait while other people went until it was your turn to go. Um, so we're going to write a schedule for which paths can have a green light at the same time. But we, we want it to be efficient. Of course, you can always just green light one path at a time, but that's, that's not the most efficient way to do it. So we want something a little more uh, efficient and we want to solve it systematically again we want it to be able to be solved by a computer um, so observe traffic lights have discrete values so we're going to ignore yellow um, and so each traffic light can be red or green um, so that makes this easy to model into a discrete problem because the traffic lights have very definite values and each path is also very definite. So um, if I turn left from A, then I have a, I turn onto road B. So if I start here and I turn left, I end up on road B and this path we could denote AB. And it's a very definite path. Um, there's no ambiguity. If we make a left on A, we end up on road B. Um, and so we can enumerate all our possible paths. So we have from A to B, a to C, and then all the rest. So from A, since C, you may have noticed, is a, is a one-way street. So we can go from A to B, A to C, or A to D, which we have here. And then B, we also have three directions we can go. And D, we also have three directions we can go. And then C, uh, we don't, none of these paths start at C. So this is uh, enumerating all our possible paths. Um, so now we want to build a model that can that we can uh, apply computer science to to discrete math to to solve it. Um, so paths that are not in direct conflict can be traversed simultaneously. So um, if we have a green light from D to C um, and from A to B at the same time, then that's fine. Uh, we don't risk a collision. Um, However, if we green light D to A and A to B, then of course we do have a risk of a collision. So that's not a safe, uh, that's not a safe uh, schedule for our green and red lights. Um, okay. So given that, how many possible schedules exist? Well, it's probably more than you would think. This is not, not as simple a problem as it looks. So there are nine paths that can each be green lit. Yeah. So yeah, any questions on on sort of the model that we've established so far? All right. So don't be afraid to raise your hand if you do have a question. Uh, and I can pause and let you uh, let you ask it. <clears throat> okay, so there are nine paths, right? So we have, if we look back here, um, if we count all these, there are nine of them. And each of them can be green lit or red lit at any time. Um, so how many possible combinations is that? How many possible, uh, how many possible ways are there to green light and, and red light all of these? Well, um, since, since there's nine of them and each of them has two distinct values, that means there's two to the nine possibilities, uh, which is 512. And, but assuming that we never actually uh, have every light red at the same time, we can eliminate that possibility. So there's 511 options. So that's probably more, that's more than I would have guessed uh, if I didn't know the answer. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each path and we're going to make a node of it. So each of these represents one of the paths. And if two paths conflict, then we're going to connect them uh, 
by what's called an edge. So we can call these nodes and uh, the connections between the nodes, we can call these edges. And then what we're going to do is we're going to what's called color. We're going to assign colors to these symbols so that no pair of connected symbols has the same color. All right, so that's what we did here. If we have, if we look at AB, for instance, um, AB is only connected to DB, which is red, DA, which is red, BD, which is blue, and BC, which is blue. So it's not connected to any one of the same color. So there's no connection from AB to AC or to AD or to BA. Um, so now what does this tell us? Um, well, this actually gives a solution to our, our problem. Yeah. So why is BA green? All right, let's step back a, step back a step. So let's not confuse these. This is not the color of the light. This is color of the node. So perhaps this is a, a bad choice of colors. So ignore the, for a minute the fact that we have green and red lights. Um, these, this green is distinct from our traffic light green. All right, so when we say green, we just mean that green represents some time in our schedule. So green represents one instance, blue represents one instance, and red represents one instance of time where we can green light all of these at the same time. So we'll get into that here. Um, so if we look, if we, if we take all the green nodes and we green light them all at the same time, then you can see here we have a, a beginning of our solution to the traffic scheduling problem where uh, we green light all of these paths and nobody's in danger of a collision. So that's our first step is assign green light to those paths. Uh, the second step, we assign a green light to the blue color. Again, color is, uh, this is separate from the color of the traffic lights. Um, so we go from BC and BD, and those are not in conflict, so we can green light both of those at the same time. And then we can green light all the red paths, so all the red paths come from D, and none of those are in conflict either. So not only does this coloring of our graph give us um, uh, what we can safely green light at the same time, but it also gives us a schedule. Um, and note, this is not the only possible schedule. There are other ones. So in particular, we could say B, this BA could be blue. So we could add it to the blue and we can green light it with the rest of the blues and it would not create any conflicts. And we know that because there's no edges uh, between them. Or sorry, yeah. And the same thing with AD, AD could be red. So there are other possible solutions, and these are the two simplest examples. Uh, there are more. All right, so these puzzles are simple instances of real world problems, and the solutions we have discussed are applications of discrete math. Um, does everybody understand what, uh, how this scheduling worked? Is there questions? Okay, so we're gonna take a short uh, 10 minute break here. And then, uh, so feel free to ask questions during the break, either in the chat or, uh, you know, you can raise your hand. I'll be uh, mostly here. Um, so, yeah. And uh, as an additional resource, this is the Discrete Mass Study Center. Um, it has a, a bunch of, of notes and also a bunch of practice exercises. So similar to what we've done here, um, but of course, a little more in depth and a little more dealing with the course material. Um, just wanted to draw your attention to it. It's a very, very good resource and a lot of the material in this course is based off that. Um, it is rather, uh, they don't explain any more than they have to, but uh, it's, it's a very good resource. Um, okay. So we'll take a 10 minute break. Uh, feel free to chime in with a question and we will see you guys at, uh, what time is it here? I'll see you guys at, 10 to 7.
okay. <clears throat> so, uh, let me just make sure here. Okay, so I'm lighting up, so I'm guessing you guys can hear me. Um, yeah, so I've been... So somebody's asking me in the chat, uh, quizzes. No, so if we look at uh, other tutorial quizzes, so there's tutorials are these one of six, two of six. These are the short quiz. Oh, yeah, wait, I got to share this with you, right? Sorry, I will get used to this. <clears throat> um, let me share my screen. Uh, here it is. Okay, so uh, the tutorials, these are the short quizzes that you can collaborate on. They're really not meant to be quizzes. They are only meant to make sure that you're keeping up on the material. So they should not be difficult. Uh, they should be easy marks. Um, uh, these quizzes are actual quizzes. These um, where you're not allowed to collaborate, um, you are timed. So you have 60 minutes to complete it. So these are tests. These are actual tests, although you will have a range of time with which to complete it. Um, so that uh, to account for any technical difficulties. So we're in this yeah, strange new world where we have to uh, sort of, I don't know, come up with new ideas of how to do these things. So um, yeah, these are the more serious ones. Uh, these are the sort of less serious ones, although do not skip these, they're easy marks. Um, you know, it's 12% of your final mark that you can just basically cash in on as long as you keep up on the material. <clears throat> um, yeah. All right, any other questions before we uh, continue with the lecture? So I think we will, uh, yeah, okay, good. Um, should finish actually sometime between 8 and 8 30 which will be just about perfect um all right let's get started <clears throat> so next we get into uh some actual course content so the introduction to propositional logic so um i'm assuming you guys are looking at slides right now that say introduction of propositional logic if you're not please let me know um all right, so let's. Good. Okay, once again, uh, the same disclaimer as before. Uh, these slides are based on slides by Dr. Robert Collier. Uh, I've modified them a little bit, and uh, so any mistakes we find are definitely mine. Um, so, propositional logic. So, we, we sort of looked at a couple logic prog program, uh, problems in the uh, last half of the lecture. Um, so now we're going to sort of formalize that a little bit. Um, so assertions or declarative statements that have a value of true or false are called propositions. So if you recall, this was uh, when we were dealing with the clowns and the uh, knights and the knaves, they made these declarative statements that had some value uh, and the value was true or false, depending on whether what they told us was accurate or not. So now we're going to formally uh, formalize this into propositions. So an example is, I am your instructor. That has a value of true. Oops. You were sitting in the Comp 1805 lecture. Well, it depends on your definition of uh, what it means to be in a Comp 1805 lecture, but well, let's say that that's true. Canada is the largest country in the world. Um, well, that really depends on the politics of the time. I think that's false. I'm not sure is Russian, I don't know if Russia is still a country or what. Um, depends on the government over there, but uh, generally speaking, I think they have a more land mass than we do. <clears throat> so we can, we have uh, all these assertions and we can associate true or false values with the information that they contain. Uh, but not all declarative statements are propositions. Uh, for example, if we say X is taller than 250 centimeters, um, or y plus z equals five. So the problem with these statements is that uh, we don't have values for the x, y, and z. So we don't know, we're saying, 
uh, there's something there, but uh, it could take on a range of values. So we cannot really say at this time with this much information, whether these are true or false, we don't know. Um, unless we happen to know the values of X, uh, <laughs> of X, Y, and Z. Um, thus, these are not propositions, um, but this is, uh, we'll get a, a little bit into working with variables uh, in the next few lectures. So in math, we can assign values to a symbol, a variable. So for example, we can assign X, we can assign a value of 16 to the variable X. And if you've programmed it all, um, you'll know that uh, variables are very, very common in programming and we assign them values and work with them. Um, so in math, we have that same concept. Um, and propositions can be assigned to variables as well. Since propositions contain values, um, we can say uh, y equals it is raining today. Um, so it contains that proposition and then it just makes it easier to work with. But it's still, if we if we substitute, if we say y, uh, what we actually mean is it is raining today, and we can assume that y has the value uh, that it is raining today has, either true or false. Um, so we use variables to make logic expressions easier to work with. Uh, a proposition, so those are propositions that we talked about. Proposition that cannot be divided into smaller proposition is called primitive or atomic. Um, so it is raining today is an example of an atomic proposition. So we cannot uh, break that down into less information. Um, so basically we have, we can associate either true or false with, with it is raining today with that statement. And there's no way to, you know, using our rules of English, break that down further. And, you know, it's analogous to having a single value in math. So if we say 16, and we can assign that to the variable x. <clears throat> um, in math, we build complex expressions. So for example, 3 squared plus 16 um, using different operators. So plus, minus, uh, multiplication, division. Um, similarly, using propositions, uh, we have logic operators uh, that we can use to build up complex propositions. Um, and these are also known as uh, expressions logic expressions. And yeah, so that's, and it's similar uh, for with very good reason, um, because propositions, uh, propositional logic is basically a branch of math. So uh, the fact that it has the similarities to regular arithmetic should not be all that surprising. And uh, So in arithmetic, we have unary operators, unary, unary, unary operators like negation, so negative five. So um, we're not subtracting five from anything. We're just saying that there is a negative five of something. Um, or we can connect uh, arithmetic expressions with binary operators, which we call connectives. Um, and that would be addition, division, uh, two plus four uh, would be an example. So that's a, an arith arith arithmetic expression. Um, and the two and the four are also arithmetic expressions and they're connected by this binary operator. And here, this is an expression and uh, we're using this unary operator on it. <laughs> um, and logical expressions also have unary and binary operators. So we're showing you all this. This should be very familiar to you just to show you that, well, these operate, the logical expressions operate very, very similarly. So if we have a proposition A, um, then A must have a value of true or false. So we talked about before how we could assign it is raining to a variable. So A is a variable, contains a proposition, and that proposition has a definite value. <clears throat> So if A is a proposition, then not A is also a proposition. So this little symbol here is uh, a negation in a sense, and we read that aloud as not A. So what that's going to do is if, uh, if A is false, then not A is going to be true. 
And if A is true, then not A is going to be false. So it's, it's going to change the value uh, to the opposite value. And well, since there's only two values, uh, there's only uh, one possible value to change it to. <clears throat> All right, so that's a, a unary operator um, in propositional logic. So any questions so far? All right, like I said, feel free to, um, you can always put your hand up and uh, that, that appears on my screen. I, I did see that at, at this point, so that's gonna work pretty well. Um, and if I don't see it right away, uh, you know, raise your hand again. Um, all right, so there's also binary operators. We looked at binary math operators like plus, minus, multiplication, division. So if we have two propositions, A and B, um, their conjunction is also a proposition. So these are uh, propositional logic expressions now. Um, so this little symbol is the and. So this is A and B. It's a logical and. Um, so it takes uh, the value in A and uh, does some operate and the value in B and then does some operation and gives you an output. Um, and the output is A and B has a value of true when both A and B have a value of true. So if A is true and B is true, A and B is true. Otherwise, A and B has a value of false. Okay. And this is, so I take two uh, propositions. I apply some operation and I get a single logical value back. And it's, you know, no different from math in the sense that two plus two is two values and I add them together and I get a, another value of four. However, in propositional logic, there's only two values that we care about, true and false. So uh, when we combine these different propositions, we get uh, a single true or false value. What's that? Okay, and so sort of um, a way to maybe keep this in your mind, although I, I, you know, caution you against taking these analogies too far, but to a certain extent they will work. Um, you can say that A and B is similar to multiplication. If we take true equal to one and false equal to zero, then we can see true and true is equal to true is similar in a sense to one times one equals one. Um, and then, you know, if we have a false and a true or a true and a false, then we have one times zero or zero times one. And those are equal to zero, the same as a math operation. And your false and false equals false is similar to zero times zero equals zero. So again, I would not, I would caution you to take this analogy too far, uh, but to a certain extent, uh, it can help you remember uh, how this logical and operation works. <clears throat> if A and B are propositions, their disjunction, A or B, is also a proposition. So this is another binary operator. Uh, this is the logical or binary operator. We read it aloud as A or B. So A or B has a value of false. When both A and B have a value of false uh, and otherwise it has a value of true. So let's look into that a little bit. It's similar to addition, but now our analogy starts to break down a little bit. Um, it's similar to addition if we have a maximum value of one. But as a heuristic, you can perhaps use it to remember um, your or True or true equals true is similar to if we say one plus one equals one. What we're really saying is uh, not zero. But uh, so if we, we keep this maximum value of one, like I said, it breaks down a little bit here, but it, it, you can still use it. True or false equals true is similar to one plus zero equals one. Uh, false or true equals true is similar to zero plus one equals one. And then false or false equals false is similar to zero plus zero equals zero. Okay, so you can, again, the analogy is not as great this time, but you can still use it. <clears throat> All right, um, so you've probably seen this before. This is a multiplication table. Um, essentially, we want to take, if we want to find what 
uh, three times two is, then we just cross-reference them and we can see that three times two equals six. So this gives us the value of uh, two operands and an operator um, in a table form. Um, yeah, and this, uh, this is basically what I just described. So the left operand is specified by the row and the right operand is specified by the column. <clears throat> Um, these tables are unfortunately limited because the collection of possible operands is infinite. So we have an infinite number of numbers. You can't make multiplication tables that will tell you every single possible uh, multiplication. You have to take some subset of the numbers in order to make a, to have some useful multiplication table. <clears throat> um, However, in pro propositional logic, the collection of possible values 